Hello everybody, this is Professor Jeff Wilkerson at Luther College once again. Now we have an introduction to sort of the theory behind uh, the laboratory component of the Physics 182 course, the second semester of the introductory sequence for physics majors here at Luther College. So now we're talking about what we're trying to do with this, this laboratory, what we're thinking about as we're, as we're in the laboratory and trying to achieve. So uh, this will be a little bit scattered and, 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 and all over the place. There's a lot of complex ideas to pull in. Um, we're going to just try to do this all here in one video. We'll see how coherent it is, but we'll follow up and talk about this uh, more in class and maybe shoot a couple more videos for, as, by way of introduction here. So first of all, what we're doing in the lab is we're not following some sort of prescription for how to find something, measure this, do this, do this, turn this knob there, go on, go on about your business this way. We don't do that. What we're doing in the lab is we are giving you a pile of equipment and saying we would like to know something about something. So for example, the first project we're going to tackle is trying to measure the index of refraction of a glass block uh, for various wavelengths of light. And Teen, if we can make precise enough measurements to determine uh, if those are different, if the wavelength, if the refraction, it, refractive index is different for the different wavelengths of light. And we'll, we'll talk about this in a separate video here shortly. Um, so that's what we're going to go about doing. Um, and so we have, we'll always have a series of questions like that. And new questions may come up. And some questions will come up, and we'll talk about those questions. We'll say, ah, we should explore this question a little bit and this question a little bit, all within the confines of the time that we have. And, and to try to keep our eye on the direction we want to go, but to follow other little threads to say, ah, we better pursue this a little bit to try to understand this. And so your first task is to try to figure out a good way to go about doing this experiment. What if I set the data, what if I set the experiment up this way, the experiment up this way, the experiment up this way? What if I measure this and measure this and measure this and do this kind of analysis? Will I get where I want to go? So you'll start, you'll jump right in, you'll test the equipment, you'll take some data and start working on this. And as you do this, you'll have to be processing data on the fly and, and, and working with the data as you go. And when you work with the data as you go, um, you'll learn things about the experiment and to say, oh, I maybe need to confine myself to um, this region of data or this region of data in order to do this. So for, let me give you an example. I'm going to I'm going to pepper this uh, introduction with a series of examples from some of the research work I've been doing with students here for over two decades now for a long time. And one of the things we do is we look at the same patch of sky every clear night from late February to early October. And we have hundreds and hundreds, th thousands of stars in that field of view. And many of them, dozens of them, turn out to be what we call long period variable stars. They're stars that are on the asymptotic giant branch and they're pulsating and their brightness changes over the course of tens of days to hundreds of days. And, and, and we have a number of these. We have, as I say, dozens of these, uh, many dozens of these that we've measured. And we measure this pulsation. We're trying to understand something about how those stars work. So we're trying to understand the nature of those stars. And one of the things that I, uh, you know, one of the driving questions that has it didn't it wasn't necessarily what we were after at first, but we've sort of figured out to be interested in it as time has gone on, is whether on average these stars are getting brighter or fainter. Okay? To say that's hard, it's a hard question to answer because they're changing in brightness all the time. So if we if we can if we could e even out that change in brightness, then we'd want we'd be able to answer the question: Are these on average getting a little bit brighter, a little bit dimmer? Now, if, if there was sine waves, if they were sinusoidal and getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer, that might be a relatively easy question to ask. But they're a lot more chaotic than that. There are multiple frequencies of oscillation, and they're interfering with one another. There's, all, there's just there's stuff going on. So it really really makes this uh, sort of chaotic and messy system. And so we'll, we'll talk about this more in a moment. But, but for, the, for the, our purposes right here, one of the things that we've learned is that when we measure, we look at stars that aren't variable. We look at the stars that are constant or, or, or appear to be constant in brightness to us. And we can take on a given night, we can look at some of those stars, a whole bunch of those stars that span a whole bunch of characteristics of, of the stars, and to say at the end of a summer, at the, we've taken all this data from February to October, at the end of that time, 
we can look at that and say, of those stars, if we measure the brightness of the star, the signal that we measured for the star on this night, night X, and divide it by the mean of the entire data set for the summer, and do that for the first, you know, the thousand brightest stars, or the 600 brightest stars in the field, or the 500 brightest stars in the field. So we got good signal there. Um, we can figure out how, what the standard deviation is of that number divided by that number. How, what's the scatter uh, uh, around that mean value? And one of the things that we've learned is that if we want to do a good job, uh, so we need a lot of data. So it's, it's a, here's, a, here's the trick, right? We need a lot of data uh, in order to be able to answer this question because we gotta, we got to measure the star all the time. But we can't have data. Sometimes the data is messy enough due to observing conditions beyond our control, atmospheric turbulence and clouds in and out and all, who knows what's going on, okay? That sometimes the data on a given night just is messy enough, scattered enough that... Um, it doesn't help us. It, we're better off throwing that away. And over time, we've done enough of this work to figure out if this sigma is um, greater than about the sigma divided by the, the, the mean, okay, because we're dividing by the mean, so it's scattered over one. So if that's a greater than about 0 0.03, um, we're better off throwing that night out. If there's a 3% scatter, if, if, the stars, uh, if the standard deviation of the scatter of the stars around their mean signal for the whole summer is, is greater than about 3%, it contributes more problem to the data than good to the data. Okay, we've done some assessment. So we've confined ourselves to only looking at nights with sigma less than or about equal to 0.03. Okay, it means some nights we have to throw out. So we stayed up all night to take data. You got to throw it out. Doesn't matter. You just got to move on and say, okay, let's, let's not account those nights. You're, you need to do similar things in your experiment. You need to look at the data and say, ah, the data in this region is all over the place. So for example, you might measure, uh, let's say, let's call it this symbol versus this symbol. Okay, and, and when you do that, you might find that the data look like this. A okay. lot of scatter here, not much scatter here. You're better off looking at the data in this region and say, I better take, I still need a lot of data. I better just get more data in this region and get rid of the data that's in this region. Okay, that's the kind of things you need to do with your experiment. So you set things up, try to figure out what you think the best approach is, and you might not know. The three of you working in your team might disagree. It turns out that happens once in a while in the physics lab. People disagree about how to approach a, a, a project. And so you might say, okay, let's, you go over to that setup, I'll go over to this setup, and you go over to that setup, and we're going to all three try three different approaches of measuring this thing. And then we're going to come back and we're going to compare and see how the three approaches compare to each other. And then next week, we're going to go all in on this one approach that we think is the best approach. That is, that, that's just a perfect way to go about doing this, these kinds of experiments that we want to do. And we want to practice that sort of thing. And it mimics exactly what I'm trying to do here uh, with my long period variable stars in the region research that I do and other research projects that I've been doing my whole life uh, look like this too. So this is the kind of thing. You might see something else. Instead of seeing this, if you do that same graph, I don't think I could draw that symbol again. I'm sorry. Uh, that's pretty close. Um, if you do that graph, that's not close. Um, if you do that graph again, what you might find, instead of big scatter, small scatter, you might find something that looks like this. Asymptote. And you might decide, you got to be careful, everything you decide, there's so much decision making that goes on, and you have to decide how to do the experiment, how to analyze the experiment, how to go about figuring out what you want to know, and, and it's really all about you making those decisions. You might decide, oh, I, this is changing so much here, and I expect it not to be changing. I expect the index of refraction of my glass block, for example, to be this to be as a constant thing for a given color of light, then I might expect that I want to choose this region out in here and not this region. It's not because of scatter, but it's because of this sort of variability along the pathway that says, I, I trust this more than I trust this. I might be wrong, okay? Every time, you, it's all about how you make decisions. 
And every time you make a decision, you might be wrong. And it's probably in your best interest to assume you are wrong. Okay? Every time you think you've found something interesting, your task is to try to break it, to try to say, I probably messed that up, you know? I need to try to break that down and, and go about this a different way and figure out why it is looking so darn interesting. You know, if I think I found that these variable stars that we're working on are getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter over time, I have to understand, did I do something in my data analysis that introduced that artifact to the data? And if so, what can I do to try to fix it? I, my first assumption is I did. I messed that up. And, and, and I'm going to go about and try, try to fix this sort of thing. Um, and, and that's what you want to do uh, in all of these cases. You won't have an enormous amount of time, but this is the kind of thing you want to approach and the kind of thing that you want to do. And it, you always circle back and take more data. Circle back and take more data. Take more data in this region. Take more data in this region. Whatever it happens to be for that particular experiment that you're working on. And it's going to get you. Uh, if it's going to get you where you want to go. You're going to have cleaner, better data, and you're going to be able to say something. In the end, your job is you want to be able to make a claim about the world. You want to claim the index of refraction of the glass for uh, light of this wavelength is equal to this number, plus or minus some other number. And we're going to work on various ways to find out what that plus or minus value is, how we're going to determine that. Okay, and the plus or minus value, it's a guide. It's not going to, you know, you're going to read stuff where people say, gee, if P is less than 0.05, you've found a thing. And if P is 0.06, you haven't found a thing. It's just, it's just gibberish. It's just gibberish. Okay, um, the idea is it just tells you, you're, the, the, you know, the smaller that number is, the more likely you are to have found something. And we're going to work on this semester. This semester, we're going to spend a lot of time working on trying to understand what the likelihood is that something is this thing, or that these two values are the same thing, or these two values are different, or what the range is. I'm 95% confident or 99% confident that these things fall in this range. And a lot of what we're going to do is work with what we call statistical uncertainty, uh, this kind of thing that comes from the scatter and the data. But there's also systematic uncertainty in there that we'll be talking about. It makes it harder to say, ah, I'm going to say it's in this range, except the whole thing might be shifted off a little bit because of the way I set the experiment up over here, over here, and I got to go back and I got to think through this. And we're going to be practicing this, and we're going to work and work and work and work on this. We're honestly less interested in how this looks, you know, what that number actually is. Uh, we're, we're, we're less interested in learning about this thing or that thing than we are in learning about the best approach, figuring out how we can be the best in the lab physicists we can be to figure something out. Because listen, uh, folks, this is what it's about. This is how this is how reality gets made. This is how we understand what reality is. This is how we understand the physical universe right here. And, and, and the better we are, you hear people say all the time that, uh, you know, here's the science and here's the art. And when I hear people say that, sometimes people just say it because it's a phrase, and, and, and people say things that they don't really mean. Um, but sometimes, often when I hear that, I say, well, there's another person who doesn't really understand what science is. Um, because they say, well, science is taking the data um, and, 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 and not making the meaning. Understanding the data and making the meaning, that's art. No, 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 no. <laughs> science and art are both beauty, but that's another that's another video for another time. But but what the science is about is taking the data, looking at the data, making decisions about the data, and, and, and making clever decisions and being creative about how you go about setting up the experiment, being creative about how you go about analyzing the data, being creative about how you use that analysis to inform what you do next and how you go about this loop sort of thing. And it's all about your decision making and your creativity creativity and we have to practice that okay making meaning of the data is the most important thing it's as important as anything else you do uh, but you can only make meaning of the data if you've set up the data properly and done a very good careful job crossed all your t's and dotted all your i's and how you've gone about doing the experiment and setting the experiment up and so this is um this is what, what, what we're going to really be practicing. I'll give you one more example from my uh, from my project here of trying to understand where these whether these long period variable stars are getting brighter or not or dimmer or not or if we can tell anything about this. One of the ways we approach this, we have all kinds of decisions to make. Uh, we want to try to be creative and clever in the way we process data. And one of the ways we do this is we'll take an average. We've got these semi-regular variable stars. When, when we make when we plot a uh, 
make a graph of signal, how bright the star appears to us as a function of time over the course of one summer. It often looks like this. Okay, so we can't fit any kind of curve to it. It's not a sign. It's nothing like that. It's a mess. And we have to decide what we want to do. Now, and so one of the things we might do in order to answer this question is take an average of all of the signal in this summer, an average in the next summer, an average in the next summer, an average in the next summer, and compare those averages, and then plot the average as a function of time for each summer. You know, we put our error bars on there like we do. And, and it's all great. We say, yeah, it's getting fainter, okay? But average is a funny thing. How do we determine that average? Uh, do we just give every single one of these points the same weight? Um, what, if, what if you had a, a spike in here in the summer? What if it was very bright for a, a short period of time in the summer? Three or four nights or five nights. Do we count those three or four or five nights? Is it just the range? From here to here, we might call it the range from there to there, or we might want to average the points. You see, you see this, how you think about finding that average, just taking all of the, the, the signal from all of the nights and dividing by the number of nights, summing it up and dividing by the number of nights, gives you one way to average that. Taking the three brightest and the three dimmest gives you another way to average that, uh, to, to compare the total range within the given summer. And sometimes, so, so sometimes you want to do all of those things and kind of compare the results and think your way through it. Right? If, if over the course of one summer, my star looked like this, you know, I, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, is, this, this, is, this, is this the range? Is it, you know, is this how bright it was? Or, 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 or does, does it look like this, you know, over the course of the summer? And it spent most of the summer down here. Um, and just a little bit of the summer up here. Uh, what do I call that? Do I call that halfway in between those? Do I weight this uh, a different way or another way? And we have to think about that and think about, well, what do we do? What, how are we actually going to go about making meaning of this? And every step, you have to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, so really, I think I've rambled enough here. What I want you to think about as you approach the lab each week, and this is really important, I want you to think about what you're trying to do is you're trying to answer a question. I want you to tell me at the end, you got to be bold. Karl Popper, we'll talk about Karl Popper a little bit. You know, he talked about how scientists have to, philosopher of science from the 20th century. Um, and he, he, he talked about um, how scientists have to be bold. You have to make a claim, and you have to know that claim is wrong. Uh, somebody's going to be able to falsify that claim and to say, but how it's wrong is going to maybe move you in the direction of being able to figure something out. So you're going to say the index of refraction in the first lab, you'll say the index of refraction for green light in our glass block is this. And it's, it, I'm going to say I'm 90% confident it's in this range or this range. Okay. And we'll talk about how to go about, um, how to go about doing that more next week. And so getting that range. And so, but that's, you got to put yourself out there. You got to just say, this is what it is. And, and this is what we're trying to figure out. Just like I'm going to have to say at some point, yeah, I think that stars, uh, our variable stars are actually getting fainter over time. Uh, even though that's not what we would expect. Uh, why is that? Then we have to go about and figure out why that is. And so this is, this is what we're going to go about doing right here. Uh, you'll have a question in front of you each week in lab. You have to you have to wrestle with it and try to figure out how to go about doing it. It's not going to be clear. It's going to it's going to you're going to be picking your way through a forest and it's going to be challenging. And and when you think you've figured something out, you don't know whether you've really figured it out. I, I tell people all the time, thinking you've actually measured something is one of the loneliest feelings in the world. You're standing in front of an abyss and you have to decide whether to step into that abyss. Did I really just measure something nobody else has measured before? Do I really know what I'm doing or did I make uh, decisions along the way here that compromised my ability to be able to, to make this assessment. And so this is all a big, uh, a, a big package we're trying to put together and get a feeling and get an understanding of what this is. And a lot of people would call that art. I, I call it science. So uh, welcome, welcome to this journey and we're going to have a good semester.